think every self-aware minister struggles with the question of how much is appropriate to reveal about themselves from the pulpit. <clears throat> this is especially true when the theme of a service deals with hard things like loneliness and grief and sadness and pain. On the one hand, I think it's inappropriate to use the power of the pulpit to elicit pity or concern. I'm not asking for anybody's sympathy. On the other hand, I think there's something to be said for authenticity, to be said for vulnerability. There's something to be said for revealing when I've struggled with some of the same sorts of things that some of us here may be struggling with. So I want to begin by telling you that I am no stranger to the December blues. I went through a period in my life when December made me feel lonely and rather sad. And that period, that period when I felt that way, corresponded to my first five or six years in ministry. Maybe my first seven to ten years in ministry. By the way, this is my 20th Christmas serving a congregation, so you can do that. Here's how the December blues were for me. Sometime around the third week of December, I would notice that all of my friends would begin flying to visit their families, leaving town to travel, heading off into their own lives, and I had this feeling of being left behind. On December 21st, 22nd, 23rd, I find myself going to work, preparing orders of service, writing homilies, choosing readings, composing prayers, and I was sure that the rest of the entire world was out there playing, but I was the sole person working on a deadline. That's not true, but that's how I felt. And then on December 24th, I'd go to work, and after services on Christmas Eve came the tough time. As I left church on Christmas Eve, when I was brand new to the ministry, I would feel this terrible sense of loneliness, this sense of being separate from all the rest of the world. Even when I had a plane to catch first thing in the morning on December 25th, to go see family or to go see friends, I still experienced that night, the evening of the 24th, as a time of loneliness, isolation, sadness, and mostly separateness. I want you to know that I've experienced some form of the December blues. There's a lot of things going on in December that can make it a tough time on our mental and emotional and even physical health. Let me say just a few of the ways. The weather in December which I arranged for to be really gloomy today, can contribute to us feeling bad. December is dark and cold, and the decreasing sunlight and gloomy weather can depress our mood. There's a lot of alcohol in December. Holiday parties, eggnog, wassail, and a lot of sugar, cookies, candy, and pie. So December is a time when our body's chemistry may get out of whack. It's a tough season for people in recovery, especially. And if we have any body issues, body image issues going on, it's a prime season for that to come up as well. There's pressure to travel and buy presents, and so if you have any financial stress in your life, the holidays are a season when you may find that anxiety spiking. And there is additional stress for those who are expected, expected to perform the holidays, cook the elaborate feasts, clean the entire house, host the out-of-town visitors, buy and wrap the presents, entertain the guests, write the sermons, compose the prayers, just, just kidding. <laughs> it's extra work, though, for a lot of people. And for many people with mental health challenges, having a routine is important. A routine is something that we lean on, people lean on to get through the day. But the holidays, the holidays disrupt routines. Schools close, work takes a break, people travel. It is a season of disruptive routines. For many people, the holidays mean time spent with family. And let's face it, that's often in emotionally intense. I'm thankful, I'm going to give a shout out to our Sanctuary for Dialogue group, 
which has offered programs over the past several years on how to better handle political differences at the holiday dinner table. But if I can tease a little bit, there are so many other ways for family members to be unpleasant to each other. <laughs> for a lot of people, December means spending time with someone you find exasperating, grating, people who get on your nerves. And then of course, of course, last but not least, is the grief and the loss that reappears each December. For many, the holidays are a time when we are reminded acutely of a loved one and are no longer here in the flesh. A parent or a grandparent, a partner or a child. Or maybe the holidays feel raw because of a divorce, a breakup, a separation, an estrangement. Or maybe a child has moved out and this is the first year they aren't flying back home this Christmas. There is a lot going on in December. Let's take a deep breath. What I want to do at this point in the sermon is offer a few words of wisdom about facing the December blues. I'm going to begin with a few practical suggestions and then move on to some other more theoretical ones. The first piece of wisdom is to practice kindness to self. One of the resources that was recommended to me was a piece called A Griever's Holiday Bill of Rights. And I'll, I'll post this afterwards so you can take notes. By uh, someone named Bruce Connolly. And I'm going to read kind of an abridged version of the Griever's Holiday Bill of Rights which include you have the right to say time out, the right to take a break and step away from demands that are being made. You have the right to tell the truth. You have the right to tell others how you are feeling, and you don't need to pretend to feel some other way. You have a right to some bah humbug days. You have a right to do things differently. If writing Christmas cards feel like an awful burden, you have the right not to send them. You have the right to have some fun. As Bruce Connolly says, when you have a day that isn't so bad and you feel like doing something fun, then do it. Don't be afraid of what someone else will say if they see you laughing and having a good time. Laughter is as important as tears. You have the right to change your mind. Holiday grief is unpredictable, and just because you told somebody you'd go to their holiday party doesn't mean you have to. It is okay. You have the right to say, I thought I'd feel up to it, but now I don't. You have the right to rest, peace, and solitude. And he concludes, you have the right to do it all differently again next year. Suppose you are the one most famous at your workplace for the sugar cookies that you bring every single year. The best sugar cookies ever. But you decide that this is just too much to do it this year. That doesn't mean that you'll never be allowed to do sugar cookies ever again. All it means is that you won't bake them this year. <coughs> Traditions don't need to continue in a perfect streak in order for them to be traditions. What I like about Bruce Connolly's Griever's Bill of Holiday Rights, Griever's Holiday Bill of Rights, is that the focus is not on trying to deny grief or fix grief or even avoid grief. Rather, it says the grief you are experiencing is absolutely real and here are some strategies, here are some things you can do to make this time a little gentler on yourself, to be truer to what you feel. The Griever's Bill of Rights is really about giving yourself permission to practice self-care and self-soothing, to center your own emotional needs. I found that when I got the December blues, it helped. It helped me to create little times of self-soothing. Self I would take a time early in December and do something nice for myself then, saying to myself, I know this is going to be a hard month, and so I want to do a little treat. And then I would actually create a treat after the holidays as a way of saying good job for getting it through. And those little moments of self-care made all the difference. So the first tip is to practice self-care. The second tip has to do with connection. 
with understanding in a profound way that you are not alone. Even though we know intellectually that we are not the only ones who are sad or grieving or lonely, somehow we forget that. And I think it's because the culture at large still insists that we ought to be joyful, thankful, and of good cheer. As my friend and colleague, the Reverend Carl Gregg, puts it, when our emotions are drastically out of joint with the rest of society, it's not always clear how we should act. This disjointedness can be particularly difficult for many people during the holidays, when we are surrounded by societal expectations and pressure. It isn't just grief or sadness or loneliness that make December hard. It's that we are experiencing those things in contrast to a larger pressure to be of good cheer. And it's that disconnect, that being out of sync, being out of joint, that makes it hard. The antidote to disconnect is connection. The antidote to disconnect is connection. One statement I take to be true, and that I try to remember every day, is a simple two-word sentence. It's a two-word sentence that was also the title of a great song by the band R.E.M. from the early 90s. And the sentence, the two-word sentence is this. Everybody hurts. Does everyone remember that song, Everybody Hurts? We've got a few, a few hands here. If you think you've had too much of this life, hang on. If you feel like you're alone, no, 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 you're not alone, because everybody hurts. I want to invite us to be brave with each other here in just a minute. And this, by the way, is completely voluntary. No one should feel singled out. You are, as with all things in this church, allowed to pass. But I want to invite you, if you're feeling brave, to raise your hand if there is some grief, loss, sadness, loneliness, or pain that you know you're going to be feeling as part of this holiday season. And if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand nice and high, and then take a look around. So... Right? You're not alone. You're not alone. Thank you for your braveness. Thank you for your bravery. For me, one of the things that made December less blue was realizing that I wasn't alone. The temptation is to fantasize that everyone else in the world is happy and joyful and out there having the grandest of time, and you are the only one who feel who's left out, who's hurt. And there is power in realizing that that just is not true. Everybody hurts. The first tip is to practice self-care. The second tip is to seek connection and to understand that you're not alone. And then there is a third tip that I might recommend as well. In her reflection piece, when Mary meets Ness, or when Erica Hewitt makes a strong appeal to remember the theological messages of the holidays. She writes these beautiful words. The other reason I won't give up on the holidays is its central message. The holy will never give up on us. In fact, from Hanukkah to Solstice, that's the message of most winter holidays. The holy will never give up on us even when we feel like curling up in a dark room and revoking our membership in the human family. What I'm trying to say is this, is that one of the things that religion and theology and these stories does is that at the same time as it brings us in touch with our own deepest feelings, it also helps us to decenter our own ego, to help us realize that there is a world beyond how we are feeling, a world beyond ourselves that is worthy of living. There's a, an evangelical writer um, who I like who puts out a piece every December called Christmas is not your birthday. <laughs> except, for, except for Charlie, who is, Christmas is her birthday, their, their birthday. Christmas is their, their birthday. But Christmas is also not your birthday. 
even though it is. I got all thrown off at the first service, and uh, then Charlie, you know, to make sure that I got thrown off at the second one as well. <laughs> which is to say, which is to say that there are parts in the story, in the movements of the world, that are not about us. And so having this, having this sense, this ability to live with greater generosity, greater facing outward, uh, and greater you know, participation in the world may in fact be um, something that's helpful to us. So those three ideas are self-care, do something for yourself, take what you need for yourself. Remember that you are not alone. And remember the theological message of the season as a way of, remind, of remembering a wider world to which we are connected. So if December is a time that brings up grief for you, if it's a time that brings up sadness, if it's a time that brings up strained relationships, if it's a time that brings up loss, if it's a time that brings up loneliness, Know that you are not alone. Know that you are welcome here. And know that in a few weeks, the calendar will flip and turn and move in new directions as it does. Amen. And blessed be. We're going to sing our last hymn of the morning. It is uh, in our teal hymnal, number 1002, Comfort Me. And um, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together.